This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everyone. People often ask how they can support more great stories from The Wild, and we really appreciate your asking. Thank you. Uh, the Wild is a joint production of myself and KUOW Public Radio, and you can support this vital work and become part of The Wild community by checking out our show notes. There you'll find information about supporting my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, through Patreon. Help fuel the next adventure. Okay, enjoy the episode, guys. Hola. ¿Qué tal? Bien. Español? ¿Qué? English, Spanish. English, English. Yeah. Did sí. you see the, the animal eating a small animal? I don't know the name in English. It's a uh, ciervo. Uh, ciervo. 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 A deer, small deer. I'm in Spain, and I've just pulled over to the side of the road to get a selfie with a road sign asking people to slow down for a very special carnivore, the Iberian lynx. A guy on a motorcycle pulls up to my car window. He's excited about what he just saw. But the small one, it was beside the road and I passed with the motorbike and it was very quiet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where are you from, de donde? Uh, Barcelona. Ah, si, sí, wow. And you? Uh, from uh, Los Estados Unidos. Yeah. Roadside wildlife viewing isn't out of the ordinary in Spain anymore. These days people are always trying to get a glimpse of something special. Maybe a fallow deer or an imperial eagle. He, he, uh, I love motorcycles as well. I'm not sure what he saw. There was a lot of movement in the forest that caught my eye too over the last 30 or 40 miles of winding mountain roads. Uh, maybe it was a lynx, huh? He's not very friendly. With no. Humans, no. Very, very secretive, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a good success story. There used to be 100 and now there's nearly 1,000. That's why I've come to Spain, to figure out what is behind that success story. Because around here, all eyes are on the lookout for the Iberian lynx. Spain's very own big cat. And because of this incredible recovery effort, my new motorcycle buddy really does have a chance to glimpse one at the side of the road. <laughs> but just how did what used to be the rarest cat on earth leap a staggering 1,000% in number in just 20 years? From KURW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Bienvenido. Hello, Salvaje. Welcome to the wild. I'm going to get my binoculars and we're heading out right now to see what we can see. Hopefully, that is a wild Iberian lynx. It's October, early in the morning, and I'm in Andalusia, a province in southern Spain. Although, winding through the brush and pine trees and cactuses on the way here, it feels more like Nevada. It's got a wild and empty feeling. Picture a Clint Eastwood spaghetti western movie. They used to film them near here. The Mediterranean mountains, including the Sierra Morena, is a place filled with Spanish legends and where the Iberian lynx somehow clung on. So this was like the most important, well, the last big population. Big, <laughs> because it was, not, it was not too big, but, but yeah. I'm with Carmen Rueda Rodriguez on the prowl for one of these elusive cats. It's hallowed ground in the ongoing story of this special cat. 20 years ago, there were only about 100 of them left. They'd become critically endangered. But uh, mainly, it was persecuted and killed by people. Yeah. And here, they don't kill the lynxes because they like them and they like to see them. So here, they don't kill them. Carmen is a lynx expert and a field technician with a Spanish conservation organization called CBD Habitat. And she's painfully aware of the difficult time these cats have had in a country where, historically, 
It's been tough to be a carnivore. So lynxes are very curious. They are cats. So they, if they see a trap or they see a rabbit or a pigeon or whatever, they just go to see what's going on. Yeah. So they are very easy to, to kill because they are like, they have like um, big cat behavior. They are not afraid of people. They are not afraid of everything. They feel like they are the kings of the land. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to, to kill a lynx. A king. A small king. Like so many carnivores around the world, through history, the Iberian lynx was persecuted as a menace or a threat to livestock and lifestyle. They were shot, poisoned, trapped, hunted, and misunderstood. But these days, there are huge repercussions for anyone who kills one. One guy poisoned a lynx and was sentenced to 20 months in jail and a $130,000 fine. The Iberian lynx is a species only found in Spain and Portugal. They are close cousins to other lynx species, like the bigger one found in other parts of Europe, and the North American Canada lynx. Here they call them los linces. They have those really characteristic long tufted ears, black spots dappled across their tawny coat, and an old-fashioned beard that can stretch down in two long triangles each side of their chin. But despite its regal flair, it's still endangered, and a real focus of attention. Carmen tells me they behave like they know how special they are. And they are very, um, I don't know the name, I don't know the word, uh, descarado. They have no shame huh. at all. They behave like a lion or a leopard. They may be small, but they behave like a self-assured top predator. All the fierceness of a 600-pound tiger in a 40-pound package. Yeah, they can jump like four meters wow. up without running. I mean, from still, then ping. We, we say they have um, muelles. Springs. Springs on the legs. Ah. <laughs> wow. And they do this since they are very, very little. I mean, you see small cars of three months old and they jump into the trees. Like, point, 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 point. Yeah, really? crazy, crazy. Carmen can sum up these cats in one word. The superstar. <laughs> the lynx. It's clear that Carmen loves these cats. She told me that she first heard about the Iberian lynx when she was 10 years old, in the early 2000s. They were in the news on TV. The journalist was talking about how they were about to become extinct. Now her life is about saving them. But I, I really like, like the small females that are like very small but very... Mm, peleona, se dice, pequeña pero matona en español. Matona, en, is it tough? You, yes, you, tough yeah. and small but with very... Yeah, with, a, with an attitude. <laughs> yes, that's it. Part of her work involves releasing Lynx individuals that were raised in captivity to help bolster the population. She remembers the very first female Lynx she released back into the wild. And it's Lechuza, it's the name, which means barn owl is the name. Oh. And she's very tough. And, and when we released, and I remember perfectly her coming out from the cage. And I thought, wow, it's so small and it's so cute. <laughs> and then we have quite a lot of uh, histories with this female because, well, uh, she lost the first kittens he, she had because a male get into her territory and killed the kittens, so that was dramatic. A tough life. Yeah. A difficult life. Yeah, but there she is, and she lives in there, and she has raised uh, quite a lot of kittens in there. She's one of the fund fund founders, founders of the population. It's founding mothers like Lechuza that have helped the wild population of lynx make a comeback. Carmen tells me the last count was put at 1,111. An amazing recovery, but the lynx are still not out of the woods. Sometimes the odds seem stacked against them. Just as I'm talking to Carmen, scanning for a glimpse of a lynx, a text pops up on her phone. Um, I got some bad news. I just received uh, that uh, lynx was uh, killed by a car on the highway. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so my partner is just asking me, just call me when you finish. Um, and let's see who it is. Yeah. The highway. It's very dangerous in that area. So. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Me too. <laughs> let's see who it is, and let's hope it's not a female with uh, cups. She gets out of the car, and I watch her dial up her partner to get more information on the incident. When she hangs up, she gives me the update. What did you find out? Uh, it, is, it seems it is a male, but it, it has been in the highway, so the, the links is completely destroyed. It's going to be difficult to know who it is, but it seems an adult. Over 30 links a year are killed on the roads here. Carmen and her team keep a record of these roadway deaths and where they occur. She calls them black points. The black points help them prioritise their protection efforts, like putting up the warning signs for motorists, clearing drainage pipes and bridges for links to use under the road, or even building an overpass. There's actually one planned for where this lynx was killed. Like the the death of one lynx allows the life of another one, maybe? Yeah, 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 that's it. But maybe we need the death of more than one lynx. (laughs) It's a pity, but it's the way it is. So it's clear these cats need space. They can cover a lot of ground. One male walked one and a half thousand miles, but then it was killed by a car. They need more than just protected national parks and other reserves, though. The conservation efforts for the lynx only work because private parties are involved, stepping in to help save this little cat. Actually, here the, the, the land is private, so, so here we have to thank the people that owns this, that they, they, they take care of the lynx and, uh, and, 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 and then let us work here as well and start to recover the species because if they didn't want to collaborate with us, then it would be very difficult to, to recover the lynx. I've learned not to listen to Google Maps in these little villages. You just end up driving around in circles. <laughs> I head to where the first lynx were released into the wild, south of Toledo. And ironically, it's a private hunting estate. They are helping the lynx, and in turn... The lynx is helping the ecosystem. It's, it's El Castañar, no? Sí, este es El Castañar, el palacio. Sí. The Palace of El Castañar, about an hour south of Madrid. It's owned by the 18th Count of Mayalde, Jose Maria de la Blanca Finat y Bustos, a family of Spanish aristocracy. The butler seems surprised to see me as I slip in and start ogling the huge foyer. Wow, incredible. There's a suit of armour, there's big oil paintings all over the walls. Huge marble columns and a marble staircase. Wow, incredible. Muy bonito. The Finca is a large private rural estate with the palace, a church and this beautiful rambling home at the heart of it. English or Spanish? Spanglish. The Count's son, Rafael Finat, is waiting for me with his enormous Rhodesian ridgeback. This house uh, is very old. It's a house from the, uh, it's, it's from the l- late 16th century. And my family bought it in, in, in 1850. 1850. 1850. Mm-hmm. This private land has become one of the most important and most northerly places in Spain for the Iberian lynx as they regain ground. El Castañar covers 6,000 acres. Inside the house, there are mounts of wild boar and deer on the walls, and there's a scent of strong Spanish cigarettes and brandy everywhere you go. People pay to come here to hunt everything from partridges and pheasants to wild boar. And the hunting is a business. Mm-hmm. So I, I also hunt, I like hunting, but, but we do, we do it for business, not yeah. for us. No, we don't. Yeah. Historically, the lynx was one of the most prestigious hunting trophies for kings and nobility in Spain. Even right up till the 30s, about 500 lynx fur were traded every year. But today, they are welcomed here. Rafael knows these cats. He tracks them, photographs them with remote cameras, remembers each birth that happens here. Last year they were... Two with five and, and one with, with four. Uh-huh. This year, three with four. He shows off photographs with the pride of a new parent. This is the mother. 
Wow. Luna. <laughs> That's incredible. This is, this is the mail. You wow, see? yeah. <laughs> a play. Oh, chasing or playing, play or maybe with a brother or a sister. With a sister. That is one male and, two, and three females. Raphael tells me why they've provided their land to help Link's recovery in their business model, along with hunting. He says it's pretty simple for him. We, we cannot uh, permit that uh, an, a, species, a species disappear. That's the first thing. Because God made the links, we cannot destroy the links. We are, we are a part of the nature also, and we must try to conserve no? and, and equilibrate everything. No? The next morning, at breakfast, I overhear two hunters, also staying at El Castañar. They're here to shoot pigeons, but they're talking about a lynx. ¿Qué, qué pasó? Anoche. ¿Qué pasó? Sí, con el lince. Estaba, había un lince, había muchos conejos, y un lince rodeando por allá. They were walking down a gravel road right outside, just a hundred yards away from where we're sitting. Domingo, 23 a las 11 de la noche. At 11 at night. It was pitch dark and they spotted a lynx in the headlights of their car. It was so interesting to me that these older gentlemen hunters were this excited about a lynx, an animal that so often in the past here was persecuted and killed. Gracias, señores. Increíble. After breakfast, I arranged to meet up with Rafael's brother, Jose Maria Finat, to talk about lynx conservation. He's known for his wildlife photography. But it's how the hunting part of it fits in that really has me curious. He's just returned from guiding a hunting trip. He's dusty and raring to go. Where can I get some pants like this? Oh, you can get them in Bentas. They can, they can, you know, they... I love them. We sit on a rock among some olive trees and he lights up a smoke. Jose Maria is very proud of his heritage and this area. You know, because here there's only mountains, you know. There's only mountains. We made the Desa, so there are many animals. And this is what I would say is the best of Europe in this, okay, in these mountains, for hunting and for animals like could be deers, fallow deers, um, roe deers, wild boar, mouflons. So this is perfect, these mountains, okay, so this is the best we also... So in 2014, the first 10 links to ever be released into the wild happened here, on the hunting estate. And it's a relationship that's still going strong. Nuria El Kadir is also here. She's the executive director of CBD Habitat and works with Jose Maria and Rafael to manage and monitor the lynx population on their land. Dile que soy muy nerviosa. <laughs> she, she said she's very nervous. She, she's she's oh, someone, no, no. She's someone yeah. who, who doesn't like to speak in public. Or she's... My friend Andrew Bennett is also here to help translate. Nuria tells me that Jose Maria and Rafael opening their land and hearts to supporting the lynx has really helped. Ha pasado de peligro de extinción a estar en peligro. So the the lynx has gone from from the status of being a danger of extinction to endangered. Maybe a small distinction, but a move in the right direction. And Nuria says when the lynx came back, they started to play a role in this ecosystem, a role that had been missing for decades. El lince mantiene su territorio alejado a zorro, que sería su competidor más cercano como alimañero. So the, the, the lynx in the, in the Mediterranean mountain uh, areas is basically top of the food chain, um, so it's the highest ranking animal, and when it's present, it reduces or controls the population of the foxes. Meaning lynx are more dominant than foxes, so they outcompete them. Fewer foxes means more pheasants and partridges, because foxes prey on these birds and their eggs. And guess what? More birds is good for Jose Maria and Rafael. More supply for the paying hunters who use their land. Oh, I love the lynx. I mean, I think there's better balance. So there's more. Before, there were too many foxes and there were no rabbits, no partridges, or nothing. And now, there's many more rabbits, padres, and many more uh, hares and everything. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it feels better. like you're managing an ecosystem here at El Castañar, yeah? Well, yeah, this, I think it's a perfect ecosystem. Fifteen years ago, there were perhaps 50 foxes on the property. But right now, with the lynx back, there are three. This is one cat and dog relationship where the cat comes out on top. 
they, we have seen that it's very it's perfect to be cons to have cons conservation, to have hunting, and, to have, and everything can go together. And there's no problem. You know, yeah. we have to go all together. And you know, because people, uh, there are many people are interesting that we fight, and you know, but it shouldn't be like that. We should be all together: hunters, conservationists, ecologists, everybody. I think it's very important. There are now 20 to 30 links at El Castañar. That's a good start, but Rafael and Jose Maria tell me it's not yet a fully functioning ecosystem, but it is getting there. And wherever there are links, their story is tied to one key species, the rabbit. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. I'm back out on the lookout for a lynx with Carmen at a place called Encinarejo. But here you have uh, uh, rabbits, so they come from there to here to hunt. She wants to share some of the other things being done to help the lynx. What are you, what are you looking for when you're searching for the lynx? Then what's the, uh, what's your advice? Well, um, there is a trick. Uh, there are birds, birds that are uh, black and white, and they, when the lynx is moving and they detect it, they do like ka 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 ka. So if you hear some birds doing making noises yeah. like ka 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 ka, probably <laughs> there will be a lynx in there. She's talking about noisy magpies. When, like, a, like a lynx alarm system. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> yes. We don't make it far from the car before we see our first lynx sign. A track. And it's a big one. I mean, I think this is the male's, the male's track. Oh, that's yes. exciting. Yeah. I love that. When do you think this was? It, this is quite fresh. I would say maybe yesterday, tonight, or something like this. Yeah, yeah. The track is about two and a half inches wide, and every detail shows in the brown, dusty road. Next to them are the tracks of a European rabbit, an animal Carmen is also eager to tell me more about. Yeah, the Iberian lynx actually has co-evolution with a rabbit. I mean, España, Hispania, means land of rabbits. Hispania? Yes. No way. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so in the past there were rabbits everywhere, and many, many, many rabbits, and it's the main prey of all the, well, the lynx and the big eagles and imperial eagle. So, like, all the big predators here, they all eat rabbits. Wow. And they are quite specialized on, on that prey. The two have co-evolved so closely, it's almost all the lynx eat. One study showed that of 360 wild lynx scats, 94% of them contained rabbit. So, no rabbits, no lynx. In the 1950s, a highly contagious virus called myxomatosis was actually brought into France by humans to control the rabbit population. That virus ended up unintentionally making its way to Spain and killing 95% of the rabbit population here too. Most rabbits have now built immunity to myxomatosis, but the numbers are still recovering. You know, I came here to make a podcast about lynx, yeah. but really it's a podcast about <laughs> rabbit management. In this, in this area it is. In this area, the rabbit is the, the key. Maybe we should plant some carrots? Yeah. <laughs> a loss of shrubby habitat for rabbits is still hurting their numbers as well. The team plants grasses and shrubs that rabbits like to eat, so they have plenty of food. And they construct burrows to encourage the rabbits to, well, breed like rabbits. She also tells me that sometimes the lynx need to actually be provided with food, especially important for the mothers with young. Uh, we construct uh, fenced areas mm -hmm. and we put uh, rabbits in there. Live? Live, really? yeah. Okay. And especially for, for the calves. When, so, the, when the females start to breed and the calves start to, to eat uh, meat, mm -hmm. then we put these rabbits uh, to help the, the female to raise the, the calves. 
So, the government has established a supplementary feeding program, strictly for situations where rabbit numbers are low and where reproductive females subsequently need help, like here. Later that evening, I'm able to see exactly what Carmen had been talking about. The dusk light is starting to close in. About 40 yards away in the bushes, I can see a three-foot camouflage fence. It's around a small cage too secure for a rabbit to get out, and just loose enough for a lynx to get in. Some have even learned the sound of the cage being opened and closed. It's like a dinner bell. It may sound harsh, providing prey in this way, but it's a tool sometimes used in wildlife conservation, in this case as a temporary way to help breeding females of this endangered species. Suddenly, I see something. Okay. Went through the arch of the tree right there. He's gone through. The, he's, he's about as far away as the pine tree there. A glimpse of a lynx tail between two bushes. The cat is just moving silently. Oh, listen, listen. Oh, I can hear him into the cage now, where the rabbits are. There's a small commotion, the sound of a cage door, and then silence. There he is. There he is. There he is. And I saw him walk right past with a rabbit hanging out of his mouth. I shine my flashlight in the direction the cat walked, and to my amazement, the lynx is right there. He's about 20 feet away right now, eating the rabbit, and suddenly it looks like he couldn't get less than I'm here. That is amazing. And there's the confident animal Carmen had been describing. I'm so close I can hear the rumbling of the lynx's stomach. Oh, he's looking straight at me. Beautiful bearded face and these long tufts off its ears and gorgeous spotted legs. I later find out that this is in fact a female named Caraca. She's made a lightning quick kill and got what she came for. The team doesn't know if she has kittens right now, but the hope is there and that this free meal will make a difference. The government's supplementary feeding program is slowly helping the lynx make a comeback. And as it does, something else has followed. Tourists. And they are coming in droves. Not for the beaches and sangria this time, but to see this Spanish superstar cat. People come from all over Spain and abroad for the chance to get a glimpse. And more importantly for Carmen, it's that direct link to conservation. Wildlife tourism should contribute to the conservation of the species you are looking at. So the idea is that part of these uh, resources are reverted to conservation so that we can somehow maintain the species. And if the species is in the territory, then the tourism will come. If the species is not here anymore, the tourists are not coming. But they are coming. Okay. Oh, I love this place. Come on, legs hanging from the ceiling. Just a few miles from where I saw the lynx, there's a local business that's buzzing with regulars and visitors, and the sights and smells are thick and delicious. Hola, señor. Encantado. Yo soy Ramón Barrios. Encantado, señor. The man I'm here to meet is the owner of this restaurant, and after a quick bite, we sit down to have a chat along with my translator, Andrew. It seems like a, a very uh, uh, hospitable and uh, welcoming place. Ramon Barrios tells me that this family business was started by his father as a small shop in 1966, selling olive oil and other local goods. The area has always been popular with hunters, so the shop became a restaurant, and then a small hotel too. Over the last few years, as Link's numbers have grown, Ramon has seen a shift in clients. The restaurant and hotel were mostly busy during the winter hunting season. But now the lynx is attracting visitors year-round. They come in fall for breeding season, and Christmas time is one of the best and most festive times to see them. Then people come in the early summer, hoping to catch a view of recently born lynx kittens. 
But he also said what, what's important is that now you get people from the world over who come to this place, to this park, to, because of the links. It sounds like a busy year. Suena como un año muy activo. Y señor... Para mí sí es muy activo, vamos. Gracias a Dios, eh. Ramon refers to the links as the crown jewel of tourism for this area. But it wasn't always this way. People were very resistant, very reluctant to uh, to, to embrace the, the links because they thought it was it was a means that they would basically cramp their activities. So it would, it would prevent them from hunting, it would prevent them from from uh, using their land to the, the full extent. Said, but that didn't happen, and the links actually helped lift the local economy through ecotourism. And it's gone to the point where the links has become a kind of national symbol of Spain. When I ask Ramon about the links, he pauses takes a breath and smiles. Es un animal. Es el rey lo que he dicho antes, muy chulo, su andar es muy bien. He said it's a, it's a beautiful animal like I said before, you um, say. it's the king, it's the king of uh, of the area and you can see that when uh, when it walks it walks with great dignity and uh, and, and with great pride. I love it. The links have brought so many people to the area, Ramon is fully booked up all next year. The potential and benefits of the links expanding across Spain is clear, but the wildcats need a little help when it comes to reproduction. What's needed is more cats, which takes me to my last stop in Spain and the brains of the operation. I head 45 minutes north into the hills by highway, then gravel road, to a lynx breeding centre. It's on a hilltop surrounded by pine trees. Security is high around these precious cats. Man, it's a little bit like trying to get into Fort Knox, so I went to three locked gates to find my way in. And now there's a driveway with a big, scary looking barking dog. Yeah, that's okay. I won't be getting out of the car. <laughs> I don't know if this is the place or not. This is where the government of Andalusia breeds Iberian lynx for release into the wild. And they're also a kind of a genetic backup population in case of a dramatic die-off of the lynx population. As I approach the doorway of the office, one of the staff stops me and points to a tray of blue liquid on the doormat. Oh, we're dipping our feet into some disinfectant here. Every precaution is taken to keep germs and disease out. In the main room, upstairs, there's a man sitting at a desk, and he's staring at a row of monitors, each with cameras focused on the cats in their little cubicles. It's all very high-tech. Wow, Wow, Lynx. Uno, dos. Oh, they're right here on the screen. This is like the Starship Enterprise with screens all around and uh, views of the Lynx. Oh, wow, he's scrolling around with the mouse and uh, following this one particular link. That's amazing to see. Quantos, quantos linces in total aquí? Total? Sí. Eh, 41. 41, wow, 41. 41. 41 linces, wow. Each of them is monitored very carefully. The cats are actually about a quarter of a mile away inside a giant fenced-off area where they don't even see or hear humans. They'll only survive in the wild if they stay fearful of people. In charge is veterinarian Maria José Pérez Aspa. She works for the government of Andalusia and knows each cat well. She points to a female on one of the screens. Recently, a mother lynx had died, leaving behind three orphaned kittens that were just two months old. And this female adopted them as her own. So they need to be with an adult, uh, if possible with, a, with an adult female. And, and this female had had an abortion this year um, and she doesn't feel very happy. Uh, oh. So we thought that it, it, it would be a good thing for all of them, for the cubs, but also for the for the female. Oh, that lost, that lost, uh, yes. mis- miscarried. Yes. And, and um, because it's good socially, they, they can have some social time and feel more happy? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Wow. Uh, uh, it has been a very positive 
um, solution for all of them. There are three lynx breeding centres like this one in Spain, and they have a very clear target in sight. 750 breeding females in the wild, a number that will help ensure enough genetic variability to keep the Iberian lynx population healthy into the future. This facility releases about 10 cats per year. So far, there are around 250 breeding females in the wild. Um, more, more or less in 20 years, we hope to, to reach the favorable status of conservation for the species. So till that moment, uh, by now, it's considered necessary to go on breeding calves and, and preparing to release into the wild. They call this goal to a viable population their mission to 750. And to get there, they need about eight more areas of the country with enough space and rabbits. The good news is that tracking the lynxes has shown researchers that the cats seem to be responding to the newfound love Spain has for them. They've been monitored around houses and in urban areas and are on the brink of reaching the capital, Madrid, partly thanks to Rafael and Jose Maria's place being a jumping off point for them. It's a really good sign that these cats can adapt and make a living now they are protected and cherished. Es un orgullo y un patrimonio natural que tenemos que defender siempre. Restoring links is a huge challenge, but Nuria Alcadia says they are part of Spain's heritage. De la especie, si no actuamos todos en conjunto, la especie desaparecería, con lo cual seríamos un poco culpables si no lo hacemos. Part of, it's part of uh, the pride that we feel for, for the lynx, and therefore if, if we don't work together to manage to protect the lynx, uh, uh, then it's, it's, it'll be our fault, at least in part, uh, if not largely in part, that the lynx uh, uh, disappears. So it'll be our loss and our fault that if the, the lynx uh, doesn't make it. But why does that matter? ¿Y por qué importa eso? Porque desaparecen especies que hay que conservar. Hay que conservar el monte de Mediterráneo, hay que conservar la biodiversidad. Hay que conservar la naturaleza. Because we have to protect the habitat of the Mediterranean mountains. We have to protect the animals that live there. We have to protect the biodiversity of the area. And if we don't have that, then we lose everything. The mission to 750, the researchers, ecotourism folks, businesses, hunters, conservationists, and the rabbits, all of them play a role in this complex conservation web for the lynx. O sea, todo tiene que estar al mismo tiempo. If any one of those pieces is missing, then the, the then it doesn't work. You have to have everything working together in the same direction. Everything working together in the same direction. Sounds pretty simple when you put it like that. And it feels like the way it ought to be as the king of cats struts into a bright Iberian future. Photos from my time in Spain are up on Instagram at The Wild Pod, and you can find me at Chris Morgan Wildlife. And for more inspiring photos, check out Jose Maria Finat's website. In addition to being a hunting guide, Jose is also a professional wildlife photographer. You can see his work at josemariafinat.com. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by people who work in it, love it, protect it. Special thanks to my translator and facilitator in Spain, Andrew Bennett, and Javier Salcedo of the Government of Andalusia. Thanks also to Manuel Martín López, a.k.a. Lolo, for teaching me to track Iberian lynx, and to Alex and Jess Hone. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle, and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. One way to support this vital work is through my wildlife organization, Chris Morgan Wildlife, on Patreon. There's a link in the show notes. Our producer is Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlees, Annie Mize, Paul Lister and his organization, the European Nature Trust, for making this trip to Spain possible. Our production team includes Juan Pablo Chiquiza, 
April Craig, Michaela Giannotti, Cara McDermott, Brenda Phillips, Theo Popescu, Darcy Riggin Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoy The Wild, please do ask your friends to follow our podcast and maybe even give us a review. Thank you and take good care.